Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we're talking electric vehicles, heralded as a key part of tackling climate change. Will their production and uptake be stymied by challenges in the supply chain, differing policies around the world, and even differing technologies? Indeed, has Western government policy been misguided in focusing on supporting passenger cars as opposed to fleets? Where does the hydrogen fuel cell sit in this? And what are the latest developments around battery swapping and wireless charging? All this is a consequential story for the commodities sector, both in how it will change the nature of power grids and also impacts on mining and metals trading. Our guest is Roger Atkins. Roger is the founder and owner of EV Outlook and one of the leading thinkers and commentators on the segment. As always, if you enjoy the episode, please leave a positive review or comment on the platform you're listening on. I also want to note I'll be a moderator at the Reuters Events North American Commodity Trading Summit in early June of this year. And as always, I hope you enjoy the episode. Roger, thanks for joining. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me, Paul. So we're talking about electric vehicles. Obviously, this is a consequential topic for the commodities sector, both in how it will change power markets and then that dynamic, but also how it changes the raw materials piece, whether that's battery metals, whether how that impacts miners, how that impacts traded markets as well. Can we just start off and just give us an overview on kind of the state of electric vehicles, the BEVs, the state of electric vehicles today, where, where we're at right now? Well, it's been a long time coming. <laughs> Let's start with that. I think there's been a few false dawns. There's been a few moments of uh, overhype. But now we are in a, on a trajectory that, that is, is, is definitely significant. I would cite three particular events in recent times that, that, that have been big triggers for that. One is China's new energy vehicle policy and just to I won't keep saying it but I'll just say it once new energy vehicles are electric vehicles in China and I think it's significant again that they they gave them that moniker new energy vehicles because fundamentally and at some point down the line what we need to see electric vehicles charged with renewable energy new energy so I think China's made in 2025 strategy their global strategy for for progress in in many aspects And the electric vehicle bit, new energy vehicle bit that sits within that is significant. Without a doubt, Tesla, this startup company that's less than 20 years old, that has been all the odds to get to where it is, led by this maverick leader who has, again, defied the odds so many times. He's the Harry Houdini of business, you know, the supreme escapology of many things. That's the second thing. And then I think the third significant moment was the arrival of Dieselgate, this moment in time when authorities around the world, consumers around the world, realized that that something had been going on pretty untoward that shouldn't have been going on. There was reason for that. People were being pushed into a corner. And it wasn't just, of course, Volkswagen. It was any OEM that was trying to significantly get to that point where the grams per kilometer uh, output of vehicles was going to meet the targets. And in, in in attempting to do so, they cut corners and they did things they absolutely fundamentally, of course, should not have done. So I think those three things, those three moments, those three events, those three aspects of um, business and the automotive industry are why we get to where we are today, which is around the world now, significant progress on EV sales. We're seeing it in some countries more than others but it's well underway. Thanks for that. So I think that the Tesla story and Dieselgate are relatively well known. But one of the things that's come up in this podcast when we've covered battery metals and its supply chain, and even EVs as well, has been the China story to this. The fact that there's been this sort of long-standing and what someone called prescient support for new energy vehicles and almost stolen a march on Western OEMs bar Tesla to that sector. Can you just dig into that a little bit? Can you just explain why that was so consequential as part of the the three-legged stool you just described? Well, you know, if you look at where the auto industry was in China, 
it was always playing catch up with the West. It was always one or two iterations behind the various global standards, you know, EU EU standards, you know, in particular. So they, they were never going to possibly even catch up, let alone overtake. So they needed a fundamental shift in order to to become that leader, if you like. And that wasn't going to happen with internal combustion engines. There's no, no doubt in my mind. I think also that you, you have leadership, which is pretty damn smart, quite frankly, not wishing to berate <laughs> the entire European and American political arena or, you know, the organs of government in general. But I think the intellectual capital, particularly in, in Asia and especially in China, has, has only increased over the last few decades rather than diminished. And we see that writ large in, in many ways in which the world now works. I think they've had a, you know, quite a sophisticated strategy of, of understanding that, well, if you want to go down this electric vehicle route, the fundamentals of that is going to be the battery, uh, probably, and we'll maybe come on to fuel cells at some point later, but let, let's stick to battery electric vehicles for the moment. And to build batteries, you, you, need, you need minerals, and you need not only those minerals, but you need to process those minerals once you've got them out the ground. So they went on a journey, basically a shopping trip around the world to look for where, you know, in geological terms, where the stuff was, what was that stuff? And then not only from that point, how could they capture and, and own this market as best as possible? So in fairness, this is Asia in general. You know, the top five companies are Asian. And of course, we're talking about South Korea and Japan as well as China. But when you look at CATL, this one company that, that manufactures something like a third of the battery cells in the world, you kind of think, well, this is this has not happened by chance. This has happened by having a strategic objective, by giving money and support to the right people, and having a plan, a sophisticated plan that's now been well underway for over a decade. And none of this has been behind a curtain. None of this has been, you know, a sinister plot. None of this has been anything other than totally visible to everybody. But for various reasons. Our leaders have chosen to, well, just kind of watch it happen and not believe it would be significant. And now it is. So we're now, Europe and the United States is in now, and I will use the word, a pretty desperate state of playing catch up. Yeah. And that desperate state, as we've covered previously, is actually about that <clears throat> the supply chains that go into battery electric vehicles, which we'll come on to. What is the state? You know, you've had this enormous support for new energy vehicles as, as you mentioned in china and perhaps you know i want to sort of do a bit of a sweep of, of electric vehicle uptake what is the state of electric vehicles in china today and, and the trajectory of them as a result of this support well quite significant i mean i think the number of registrations per year in china is anything between 20 and i think it peaked at 27 million so the production of electric vehicle uh, production of vehicles sorry on the planet globally is about set between its 70 and 80 million so you know they've got a significant chunk of, of of making the vehicles on the planet it's been pretty well incentivized it's a very different dynamic because you've got a different structure to society and the way that the country and cities work many more mega cities rather than lots of smaller cities like you see in the US and to a certain extent in Europe. So you, you have a different marketplace in terms of requirement for distances to travel, where people live, where people work, so on and so on and so forth. And you have a very different setup in terms of the grid system, the, the players in the electricity distribution energy distribution market you know essentially you, quite frankly you've got two you've got um, china state grid and china southern grid and this is a significant benefit as well this sits very neatly underneath the foundation of who's going to make all these electric vehicles where are they going to make them and where are they going to sell them so there are some significant structural differences and also because you're trying to it's a highly regulated market in terms of a license to even have a car, you know, have a have a, have a driving license. So the, 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 it's a command and control system rather than a free market system. So it's been driven very much by policy and uh, carefully calibrated to put it to this point. Most recently, in fact, I think who what is it now? Maybe three, four, maybe even five years ago, the government mandating a production quota 
from manufacturers that they would need to build up to make, you know, like 10% of their vehicles, I think it began with, um, that would be new energy vehicles. They couldn't just make whatever they wanted. So in other words, yeah, carefully managing and manipulating the market and that journey of saying thou shalt make this many EVs uh, is forcing the market. So, so it's, you know, you then have people saying, yes, but what about charging infrastructure? What about this? What about that? And it's a bit like, well, yeah, that's a problem you've got to solve then. Make it happen. So of that 20 odd million registrations, what's the penetration of EVs in China? And how does that roughly compare to, say, Europe? Well, I think it's about 10% of, of the market, but growing rapidly. And they've had some they've had some big years where you've seen the prospect of incentives being taken away. So what that always does in any market, not just China, it sort of squashes the demand into a period because everyone says, let's do it for, before the offer's gone, you know. So that's happened a lot. But you've got, you know, some significant players and some real innovation coming in in charging and perhaps we'll come on to that later but things like um, battery swapping that's that's a fascinating arena in my opinion so compared to say most countries it's significantly more but you do have standout countries outside of china like for example norway netherlands is pretty good germany is coming up on the rails uh, quite a bit and again those markets certainly norway that reality of quite considerable and in fact probably in terms of market dynamics norway is the strongest market in the world absolutely driven by incentives and government policy it's not a natural flow and you know supply and demand scenario that you see in in many new products especially new new technologies as they arrive on the market so that support that you're seeing that is you know in norway in europe and elsewhere is consequential in this story that we're looking to tell here because i know that it, you certainly feel that that's perhaps misplaced in the context of esg but just before we get there the newspapers are filled with at the moment post pandemic and this is in kind of in crescendoing noise about evs coming from the oems all looking to invest rapidly and move their fleets towards electric vehicles. And that's then is triggering issues that we're seeing today about, you know, Elon Musk very publicly talking about the cost of lithium and will he have to go upstream. But that aside at the moment, is this a response by Western OEMs to consumer demand or to pressures from government policy? Great question. I think it depends. It's definitely a bit of both. If I had to pick one more than other, it's government policy. It's that the narrative from most governments now in Europe, the European Union, for sure, um, certainly the UK government, and especially the new, well, relatively new administration in America, it is, is all about legislation, is all about timelines where we need to go cold turkey with internal combustion. And these you know, declarations of, you know, by 2030, 30, thou shalt not make any more internal combustion engines. And, you know, up to a point, of course, I, I'm all for that. I'm an electric vehicle advocate. Drive an EV. I don't want to be pompous about that. But, yeah, this is all good. But, but it's all well and good saying you're going to do things by a certain date. But what you really should do before that is work out what's the practical reality. Within, you know, less than 100 months, can we really produce enough electric vehicles, get enough batteries to fulfill demand? At the moment, from what I'm seeing, and I'm not saying I've got, you know, an absolute model on this that's sophisticated with all the numbers in, but my definite gut feeling tells me, no, we won't be ready. We won't be in a position to do that for a number of reasons. So it's policy that's driving it. And I think the auto industry is on the back foot a bit. It's on, on the back foot for lots of reasons. The rising concern of climate change. I mentioned uh, Dieselgate earlier that that kind of didn't do the brand automotive a lot of good in the public's eyes. So I think that that they're they're pretty much on, on the back foot in terms of customer demand. Yeah, it's there, but I think it's tempered with a frustration that EVs just seem to be a product proposition for the wealthy and middle classes, and and, and for people who are you know got enough money in general to buy a nice new car. Number one and number two have a nice home with a drive to charge it on. So, you know, <laughs> there are a few things going on here. The reality is that the the EV market is constrained. It's constrained by its upstream, 
the batteries that need to go into these markets is constrained by charging infrastructure and it's constrained by cost in the sense of for the most part these vehicles with some notable exceptions like the tesla 3 pretty much more high-end vehicles right they're at the top of the range Audis, portions etc so then government policy comes into play that they're supporting these and in a constrained market you argue uh, that electric vehicles at the, for the consumers is probably the wrong emphasis if our goals are to tackle climate change that's quite a big statement that struck me when you and I first started talking. Can you walk us through that reasoning? Well, my electric vehicle journey began in 2007, sort of properly. I'd had a dabble with hybrids, with with taxis a few years before that, but properly in 2007. And that was an electric van. It was a small startup company called Modec. It went on to be reincarnated in America a few years later as the Navistar E-Star. But what was it? It was a goods delivery vehicle. It was a vehicle that FedEx, UPS, and and others bought to deliver stuff. This was a challenging moment in time, of course, 2008, 9, 10, 11, the financial crisis, etc. So that was kind of snuffed out, as, as it were. But here's the thing. We've always had, to my mind, and that of many others, a twin imperative. That twin imperative is to tackle climate change, which is principally about the reduction of CO2 into the atmosphere, take it out if we can, stop putting it in for sure. The twin imperative of CO2 reduction, but also improved urban air quality. To date, most of the incentives have been, you know, on electric cars, have been enjoyed by the people we've mentioned a moment ago, people who've got a reasonable, you know, income and can fo- afford these relatively expensive electric cars, rather than incentivizing electric taxis, buses, vans, and trucks, which Anyone listening to this, if you live in an urban area, let alone a big city, you look out the window, go for a walk. What you'll mostly mostly see around you are diesel vans, buses, taxis, trucks. And we could have, should have been, could have been, and now now absolutely, definitely starting to incentivize the adoption and support the adoption of those vehicle fleets, not the passenger car proposition. Because again, if you take the three principal challenges that have been there for for some time, still are with EVs, cost, range, and charging infrastructure. Well, urban operating, defined mileage, back-to-base commercial vehicles have far less a challenge of of cost because you can, you know, look at operating. It's not about capex. It's about, you know, marginal cost, operating cost. And you can schedule and plan that. Charging infrastructure is typically back at the base. So you've either got it or you haven't got it. You look at what power you need. You have to upgrade it, perhaps, whatever. And I know this because this is the journey we went on with people like FedEx and UPS back in 2007, 8, 9, 10. You know, I've been in these facilities and and looked at how it works. Uh, And then range. You know, range is definitive in most or many commercial vehicle applications. You know what the vehicle will do as good as every single day. The taxi will take... 20, 30 different people, and it will go between 100 and 200 uh, miles. The delivery van will make 200 stops and maybe only drive 50, 60 miles, if that, you know, in a lot of big towns and cities. So the match to EV technology, as it's been for the last almost two decades, is a far better fit than trying to work out what should the range be of a car? Should it be 200 miles, 300 miles, 400 miles? It depends. Mrs. Miggins, who likes a nice little car to drive up and down to the shops now and then, is a very different person to Julia, the rep, who goes and drives 50,000 miles a year. They might both want an EV, but the challenge of engineering a proposition that's going to suit them both is just nigh on impossible. It will inevitably deliver compromise at either end. For the rep, it's either not enough miles or for the person, whatever, it's too big a battery and therefore the cost is too big or whatever. So why haven't fleets gone after this? <clears throat> is it because they're competing with these high-end consumer cars that are taking all the resources and the engineering solutions? Or is it, why haven't they embraced this with, with, a, you know, with alacrity? And are we indeed seeing this in China? Has the Chinese support gone into fleets? Yes, it has, more into commercial vehicles because they've understood the Pareto law. 20% of the vehicles create 80% of the pollution. What are those vehicles? The commercial vehicles. 
And I remember being in China, you know, quite a few years ago now, talking to several people about this reality, because let's just very briefly go back to China. Why has the Chinese government had this policy? What is this all about? It isn't just, if you like, <laughs> world domination on the automotive scene. It's also about dealing with the fundamental issue of air quality in Chinese cities, which is a very dangerous political situation to have, because if your population are being essentially poisoned by the very thing that everyone's trying to do, which is make money, run business, you know, grow, you know, GDP of 10%, whatever, the, the unintended consequence of this has been profound pollution challenge. Uh, it's not just from vehicles, of course, but, but they're, they're a big culprit. They've been much more targeted in this than we have. And a lot of the incentives, if I think in the UK in particular, you know, a lot of the incentives early on were just for cars. And there wasn't any real dialogue between government and, and the vehicle manufacturers to, for example, say to someone like um, Daimler, you know, Mercedes, what sort of market do you need to, to make it viable to make them the Sprinter, you know, classic delivery vehicle? into EV. They said, well, we need to know we're going to have 100,000 vehicles. That, that's kind of, without that as a base number, we, we we can't justify going into the vehicle program, making it happen. And it, it wouldn't have been too difficult for for the EU and, and individual governments even to, to work out a kind of strategy to say, okay, we'll help stimulate the market. We'll give you some initial support, perhaps even guarantee future values on, on batteries, for example where they might go in terms of um, renewable energy storage, it, it's all been a bit hit and miss. It's all been, let's just let the market you know, decide. So, yeah, it's a story of lost opportunity. But for me, and forgive me for using a classic British turn of phrase, it's been arse about face. We should have electrified commercial vehicles first, passenger cars second. Are we seeing that change? You've got the, you know, the latest Biden infrastructure plan over here in the U.S. that supports electric school buses and a whole manner of fleets as well. Are we starting to see that recognition? But are we at a stage where actually the capacity of the electric vehicle market is full stretch because simply of the supply chain being dominated in China and it taking, you know, we both uh, have shared discussions with Simon Moores of it taking seven years to get a a mine and a gigafactory up and running to supply these batteries? You've asked two or three questions in there, so I'm going to try and tackle them. Am I cautiously optimistic? Uh, yes. Are we seeing some good progress in terms of uh, commercial vehicle fleets? For sure. We're seeing both from the incumbents. You know, I mentioned the classic vehicle that, that I always felt was our key competition back in the day when we came, just this little startup, it was was the... Um, was the the sprinter mercedes sprinter now ford with the transit the coming out but here's the thing uh, there was a little engineering company in canada called azio dynamics who worked with the ford motor company back in 2007 and 8 9 i think and produced the ford transit connect a little kind of sm small transit that was fully electrified and i because of all the absence of things strategy and money etc that, that i mentioned that 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 just died a death and and shouldn't have done so yes, we're seeing administrations focusing on it more. Yes, we're seeing more product on, on it, whatever. But the challenge is going to be we might see that stymied by simply the lack of raw material supply into the gigafactories, whether they're existing gigafactories from the, from the big five in Asia or, or certainly the ones being you know set up now in, in Europe and America. There's a really weird scenario that could happen here, if I can quickly allude to it. Just at the time that legislation and consumer awareness does start picking up strongly for EV, maybe the only people that can supply those EVs in any number are going to be the Asian players because they'll be the only ones with, with the batteries. South Korea, you know, with Hyundai and Kia and all those people, the Japanese to an extent as well, but certainly the Chinese. Yeah, it's interesting. We had Daniel Jurgen on this time last year talking about one of his new books. And, you know, it was fascinating the, the fact that the Western, especially the US OEMs, very much saw China as their future opportunity. 
and they've made great strides in those markets, particularly GM. But there is a scenario in a few years' time that actually it's Chinese car manufacturers who are supplying Western markets simply as a result of this dynamic tied to the upstream. That's where we, even as we talk today, April the 11th, you've got Ford coming out talking about upstream partnerships. You've had Elon Musk, as we said, talking about having to go upstream. I think there's been a groundswell of recognition by the OEMs you know, that this is their most significant challenge. How do you see that playing out? Do we, you know, are we going to see, have to see vertical integration for them to achieve these objectives? 100% yes. Here's, here's the irony in my mind. I think Elon, Elon Musk is a great scholar of history. I really do. Yes, he's doing all this leading edge stuff, going to space, you know, all these kind of extraordinary things. But I think he's also well read when it comes to history. So look at Henry Ford. How did he set up the Ford Motor Car Company? He vertically integrated it. Why? Well, actually, he didn't have a choice because there, there wasn't a supply chain. So you could argue that was inevitable. But the reasons he also did it was that uh, he wanted to manage and control his supply chain. He wanted to capture margin because, in other words, it, they're your companies. So you, you're keeping whatever profit there might be fr from them. And you so control the, the, the innovation because it's kind of all in-house. And here we are now. Tesla basically set up shop and did exactly the same thing with building this new world. So there wasn't so much of a supply chain uh, for electric vehicles in many ways, just like back in the day with Henry Ford when he set up. So Elon just, I think, copied the Henry Ford playbook which was start to dig into and buy into, vertically integrate into that supply chain. Look at how they've managed to continue producing cars when others have just fallen over when it comes to semiconductors and the, the software challenge. What I'm told, I'm, I don't work for Tesla, I, I'm not in there, don't drive a Tesla even, but they very cleverly reprogrammed, you know, rewrote a lot of the software to accommodate the fact they couldn't get certain components, chips, etc to still be able to carry on making their vehicles. I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's visionary. You, you can see how it, how it plays out. Talking of Elon, and it just triggers a question in me. He hasn't focused on fleets, though. He's very much focused on, on passenger cars, on consumers, those you know, high-end aspirational vehicles. Yes, he has. And if you, you know, reread the original Tesla strategy, it was to start with a Roadster, move on to the Model S and, and sort of come down all the way and enable the people who've invested a lot of money in you by buying those expensive products to, it's, it's like it's like the story of the, the elves and the shoemaker. You know, you have to keep making money in this place to then afford the raw materials to make this other thing. And, and successive, successively, progressively come down to a point where you could be mass market. You mentioned Model 3 earlier. It's still not really what we hoped they would end up having by this time, which is, you know, $25,000, $30,000 car on the road. Whether that is ever going to come, I'm not sure for a reason we'll talk about perhaps later. But no, he hasn't focused on fleets, but, but I don't blame Tesla for what they've done. And whilst I say we should have focused on commercial vehicles, I fully understand what what they've done as a strategy and, and really can't, in a, I can't, who, who would I be to, to criticize it? I think They've been exemplary in, in having a strategy, number one, and number two, pretty much delivering on it. Let's get into it now. Why don't you think they'll ever get down to that mass market? Right, because I don't think there'll be a market there. What I think is going to happen is you're going to see some resegmentation of how the car market, how the vehicle market works. Mass adoption of electric commercial vehicles, for sure because we need all of them, or certainly as many as possible, to not be on our streets with, with tailpipes, with, with ex exhaust pipes. Even if, you know, I know the argument, long tailpipe is the, is the power station, it's coal-fired coal and all of that. Yeah, but you're dealing with a zero tailpipe proposition in situ, which means there's nothing coming out the back of it, and the air quality locally is better. So sorry to kind of reiterate that point, but so that's a big segment. I think you're going to see an upshift segment into luxury and higher value vehicles that will have varying degrees of autonomy on them, which will be, if you like, just, you know, things to make driving more of a pleasure. So when you're in traffic, you don't have to drive it. You can do this level three, sub 40 mile an hour, let the vehicle drive thing. You can do what you want. 
talk to someone on your phone, you know, do some emails, whatever. Uh, but these are kind of like toys, if you like, for the relative still, the relatively well off. And, and at, the, at the far end, you know, hypercars, supercars, you know, crazy, amazing technology, but all very expensive. And then for the mass kind of middle market, what would have been the kind of lower medium segment, upper medium segment of the market, I think you're going to, we're going to throttle ourselves into quite quickly over the next five to 10 to 15 years, shared electrification, and people won't be owning cars. And what those cars will be in terms of their body style and 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 whether they'll be for one person to be in or two or shared, you know, four or five people, six people even, maybe even like minibus things. That's where I see, you know, mass market mobility going and shifting away from owning cars that are owned, you know, mass market today. I think it, I don't think it'll be a segment anymore. I think it'll disappear. Uh, and what's the drivers behind that? Is that just simply you, you won't see costs of these vehicles go down sufficiently? People don't have the, the charging infrastructure, power costs are going to go up or whatever it might be that actually, or, or, you know, what's behind that? I have to say, I'm probably over fond of um, certain phrases and quotes from different people. I probably overuse them. I should try to be a bit more original and come up with some myself. But necessity is the mother of invention is the answer to your question. So we have more and more people living in cities and urban areas, more and more uh, lack of space, more and more congestion if we have too many vehicles on the road and um the challenge of of resources to to build all these batteries to make 80 million vehicles a year is just i think just too overwhelming and i think almost like the cavalry arriving just at the moment in time the development and progress of varying degrees of technology that will come together converge to enable shared autonomous stuff that will come because it has to, because I think the, the global economics and, and two of the core principles of, of, um, uh, of circular economics, maximize utilization and maximize efficiency will come into play. So the efficiency thing is electrification, production of energy, distribution of energy, charging stuff and, and all of that. And then maximizing utilization. I don't think we can any longer afford to be making 80 million cars a year that for 90% of the time don't move a wheel. I think, I think that's a, a 19th and 20th century luxury that will pass. We can't afford it anymore. And do you think policy support from Western governments will fall into place behind that if you see a dominant China in the upstream batteries supply chain and the electric vehicle market, there'll be even more incentive for them not to disrupt trade imbalances, all the rest of it, and promote you know, autonomous fleets at the population level? Yeah, that's a, this is a very big question. Again, you go back to that made in 2025, China's, China's sort of key, key kind of industrial strategy. Another key part of that was AI, the, the focus on artificial intelligence and the development of things like you know, robotics and driverless technology, you know, some, some, some companies that most people understandably have never heard of, like Pony AI in China. There's a number of these, these people who are developing the, these technologies and, and capabilities to deliver on this stuff. But to answer your question, I'm not sure, because I think it's almost like it feels to me like Western governments are caught like the, the proverbial rabbit in the headlights. It's a bit like, oh, that's right, it's EV. Let's sort the EV thing out. And then people are shouting sort of in the background, but what about driverless technology? What about, oh, look, we can't deal with too many complicated things. And in a way, I don't see EV as being the real paradigm shift. I think the paradigm shift is shared mobility, better public transport, because that's a brand that you know, public transport, when you say that for most people, it means, oh, that's what poor people use. Well, that's what people have to use if they've got no choice. In fact, what it should be is this is a solution to many of our problems. And if we can make it better, cleaner, brighter, just more professional, then more people would use it. But it's kind of in many places fallen into disrepute, disrepair, whatever. But I think that you can see that coming back in, in many places. I'll give you, a, for instance, so in terms of my concern about governments. So the UK government, with the best intentions, recently published uh, a strategy for charging infrastructure how it should be, how many charges we'd need, who'd have to do it, something to do with funding, a few other things. I word-checked the document 
there wasn't one mention of autonomy or driverless in it. Now, you could say, yeah, but Roger, these things have been coming. That It's not actually going to happen. All of this autonomy is much harder than people thought. They were promising this stuff, you know, we'd, we'd be there by now. Well, there's no doubt it's become a lot harder than people realise. There's no doubt. It doesn't mean it won't happen. And, and again, using uh, plagiarising someone else's words, a German economist once said, things take longer to change th than you think they would, and then things ch change faster than you thought they could. And I think that that is going to apply to autonomous vehicle technology. But governments aren't, aren't, aren't gearing up for it. They're, they're just gearing up for the electric vehicle revolution. And another person that, that kind of, ex well, two other people that I know of real merit that, that have said a similar thing, and, you know, we, we've talked with each other. One was Marty Rimac. M Marty Rimac, uh, three years ago, uh, interviewed him on stage in Berlin. He is the founder of Rimac's Automobili, which now owns Bugatti, which is part of the Volkswagen family. He's a significant electric vehicle entrepreneur. His view is that, you know, the convergence of technologies, enabling technologies, will deliver vehicle autonomy, and we won't have mass adoption of EVs. I have the same view as this very, very smart young man. So as an old git, I feel quite quite pleased that someone who's actually really intelligent and an engineer has that view. And then Shai Agassi, who is famous for having built the proposition that was and no longer is better place, the battery swap proposition. I had him on a podcast of my electric and eclectic podcast show, and he said, from as he was seeing it all evolving now, that electric vehicles are just a precursor to shared mobility. They are just an enabling technology to what's to come. So the real game changer isn't the EV, it's what the EV enables. Yeah, it's interesting as well, because we've discussed this on a previous episode with Arkady Sozanov, um, CEO of Freewire Technologies, an EV charging company. I listened to that one. That, that, was, that was a good podcast. I enjoyed that. Yeah, he's an interesting guy and an interesting company. But one of the things he highlighted was where autonomy really starts to come in is when you think about grid as well, grid optimization, and actually taking the decision of charging out of the hands of the driver so that you actually can, you know, there's a tie up here with moving to decentralized generation, the nature of the future grid of power. So I'd encourage people to listen to that. But the okay, so two two final questions. It's been fascinating. It was even in the paper today I was reading, New York Times, talking about the decision making. I know this is very much an electric vehicle or battery electric vehicle episode, but you've still got at the fleet, the long haul level, and I'm listening throw trains in there as well, a debate at the board level of companies about whether they're going to go hydrogen. Or, or fuel cell or going to go battery EV. And the article itself highlighted this is almost as consequential as Betamax, well, it's much more consequential, but Betamax versus VHS for, for those of them us who remember those. <laughs> but that's still very much a live debate and certainly a triggering debate within the commodities community. But where's your take on that? Right. Well, let me preface it by saying I'm not an engineer. I'm just lucky enough, Paul, to have been in the company of lots of smart people. I worked at Ricardo for a few years, which is a pretty good blue chip engineering consultancy company. One of the things I remember from being there was solutions have to be application specific. In other words, you can't say this does or this doesn't work. It depends. Solutions are application specific. So let's take the answer to your question. Number one, it needs to be green hydrogen the only color that matters. All the others are counterproductive to the ambition of reducing carbon into the atmosphere. They may work, they may have commercial applications, but they need to be, as soon as possible, consigned pretty much to history. However, this is where then the story of the growth of renewable energy kicks in, because that is going to and should accelerate very quickly. And as it does, the scale of that is so huge that we won't have enough batteries to go around for the EVs and all the power grid, or uh, all, all the intermittent energy uh, storage. So we need another solution. Uh, and that's where electrolysis and hydrogen comes in, because, again, application-specific propositions for larger vehicles, uh, for shipping, for marine, uh, for aviation, you can produce it in an intelligent way where 
yes, some of the some of the metrics when you, when you look at them are a bit like, well, why don't we just use electricity and have a battery? Well, because it won't work because you won't be able to get the batteries. You can't have big and heavy batteries in this or that application. So therefore, you need a different proposition that, that's going to work. So and, and therefore, it's not like I don't understand why, why you said it. It's not like Betamax and, and VHS because, you know, one became so dominant, it just finished off the other one. Both of these are applicable, but it depends on the application. Batteries over the last 10 or 20 years have come up so fast on this. Inevitably, the clear blue water, as it were, it were for hydrogen has changed. But again, my opening my answer to this, I, I spent a few hours in the company of a guy called Billy Wu, who is a really smart um, electrochemist at Imperial. He's a lecturer there. And I asked him about, you know, where, where were we with hydrogen versus batteries and, and all of this stuff. And he said, Roger, there is room for both. And we have to have both. We can't have all our eggs in one basket and so on and so forth. And, and you know, it's all about um, an application-specific solution. You, you, you can't be binary in this. It's not like politics. You can't, you know, in politics, you have to vote for one or the other. But, but in this case, to sort of sum up my very long-winded answer to your question, simple answer is it's both, not either or. Which is a challenge, right? Because that's a significant investment required from Volkswagens and the Daimlers of the world, you know, in, in both segments to, um, you know, to make sure that they don't miss out. Well, yeah. And if I can very quickly add in a couple of other things, battery swapping, I think is significant. If you look at what's happening now in China with that, because that is about local power management, that is about decentralizing the grid, that is about having little kind of mini power stations. They might be battery swap stations, but they're also energy facilities uh, to capture and, and organize. A lot of people missed this first time around with uh, Better Place, and they didn't capitalize on that proposition and could have, should have, would have under different circumstances. But now NEO in particular, but also Geely and others have got the ear of the government because they, they see where this sits in the energy management ecosystem and the e electric vehicle proposition there are now nearly a thousand battery swap stations from neo alone in china and now they're opening them up in europe i've been to the one in um in norway that's the only one outside of of, of china so i think contrary to what a lot of people have thought about battery swap that will emerge and then the other one i quickly want to talk about is wireless charging go to first principle of an ev it runs on an electron the motor runs on an electron Yes, it needs a battery to store those electrons, but it doesn't necessarily need a 90 kilowatt battery pack. If you could take that range, that 90 kilowatt pack, and put it into the charging infrastructure, wireless charging infrastructure, in order to still operate, to give range in that fashion. And I've seen this for myself. I've been in America looking at BYD electric buses. Some of them have been running for a few years with this technology. That, that have got extended range because they can pick up charge at the bus stops, high power, automatic, safe. And so the, I think that has part of the journey as well, because that will mean we can still have lots of electric vehicles, particularly closed loop environment vehicles, again, like the commercial vehicles, but charge them up to a great extent and give their range through wireless charging rather than having to drive around with big, heavy batteries on board all the time. So there are, this is another one of those converging technologies I, I talked about earlier. Uh, fascinating. And I could go, <laughs> we could go on for a long time. But I do want to go on a little bit because battery swapping, I mean, this certainly sounds consequential to the commodities sector. Again, we've, we've had an episode on batteries themselves and could they become a commodity? But do you actually mean these cars drive up and just swap out their, their batteries and off, on they go again? And, and what did you mean by it's consequential for energy management. Yeah, these are power stations. So you you have a, a battery swap facility. You can go in and out in it in just a few minutes, um, and you get a fresh battery. It's not your battery, by the way. So you're 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 buying or leasing the vehicle. You're renting the battery, and therefore you can rent a battery that only, sets, for example, does seventy miles because that's what you do most of the time. But when you go on holiday and you go on weekend trips, you want a bigger battery. And you can get a bigger battery by going into the swap station and getting a bigger battery because it's not yours. So it's battery as a service. Here's the other thing. Being able to safely integrate a swappable battery pack 
means something else. It means that when you come to want to use that battery pack for energy storage, it's like a cassette. Take it out, slot it in. Much easier than how many other battery packs are pretty much integrated into the vehicle chassis and are much more complicated and therefore expensive to extract. And I put a video up on LinkedIn, by the way, of my my trip to, well, I've been to China a few times to the Neo factory, to Neo swap stations, and I went to the one in Oslo. So they will be charging up at the time when the electricity is cheaper and more accessible. And then often, and, and they I think each swap station has about 13 battery packs in it, 13, like 90 kilowatt battery packs. So it's taking a lot of what could be often surplus electricity that the renewable system can put into it. We're all going around the world at the moment, seeing all these turbines often not going around. Well, there's a reason for that. There's no point in them going around because electricity isn't going to go anywhere. It can't be used. It, there's no need for it. But if you can store it, again, goes back to hydrogen story. This all makes sense. So, And China's state grid and China's southern grid are hooking up with NEO, for example, as are, very intriguingly, Sinopec, big company because it's about energy, the distribution of energy. And whether it's electrons or hydrocarbons, there are people that are good at understanding the manufacture and transit and and use of those things better than others. And whether people like it or not, perhaps counterintuitively, the oil companies are very good at understanding how to move stuff around the planet. Yeah, and so are commodity traders uh, within those oil companies and independent (laughs) traders. So, you know, again, I think uh, this is one of those discussions and topics that's sort of edge, the edge of the market but might be a significant part or well, it is already going to be a significant part both in power consumption but certainly the upstream supply chains for those critical metals and the investment that's going in from different governments and policies and so forth but also very much i think uh, when you talk, start talking about battery swapping you start talking about power trading just in a different way um well i will we'll put links to ev outlook in the episode description and links to your podcast and and i encourage people to do the journey i've done with you which is go on all of your posts on linkedin where you're very active talking about these topics right at the the edge and the center of the electric vehicle or the new new energy vehicle world because I think it is just so consequential, not just for the commodity sector, but for the for for, for us all as individuals uh, as well. Well, Paul, all I can say is, you know, again, thank you for inviting me. I've enjoyed the well, what has been a revelation in getting to know and understand the mining and min- mineral processing industry, commodities market. Um, the, these past what three three years or so, and uh, I definitely am the better for it because I can deliver a better narrative to to the followers on LinkedIn and and be a little bit more, I think, productive in giving people, you know, some suggestions and pointers and, and all of that stuff. It's all well and good commentating, but a lot of people want, you know, practical ideas and solutions, contacts, all of those things. So that's just what I try and do. I try to weave that all into, you know, my storytelling. Great. Well, it's been a real pleasure, Roger, and I look forward to having you back on in a, a year or two and, and catching us up with, with how the journey's been. Hopefully I was more right than wrong, but, um, you know, <laughs> nobody's perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and Human Capital, a search firm dedicated to the commodities sector, go to www.hcinsider.global, where you'll find more original content on the commodities sector and more details on our offering as a search firm and our locations around the world. Thanks again for listening.